admire people's successes but never take the time to explore their challenges. Talk to Lady brings out the inside stories of the peaks and valleys of our daily struggles. A weekly show that features people and stories from all walks of life. I probably don't look like I chopped cotton or picked cotton, but I did. And now, in a, in a, what, this is a half a million dollar property at home, up to half a million dollar home. You'll hear success stories from rags to riches that will inspire you to aspire to be great. Be the first to know only on LSTV One. Hello to our darling viewers out there. It's your girl again, Lady Bar, coming to you today with the Talk to Lady Show, live on LSTV One. Don't miss the show every Friday. And today I have a very special guest, a guest who is a Gambian, but then I'll allow him to introduce himself. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bash. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure, like I indicated. Um, I'm honored that uh, you've chosen to have this conversation with me. Thank you very much, much for accepting our invitation. Um, for those that do not know who George Bass is, where he's from, originally school background and things like, a brief description of yourself. Could you please tell us who you are? Well, of course. Uh, let me let me begin by saying um, I, I am really delighted and I'm proud of uh, seeing my Gambian sister really doing her thing. So um, I couldn't say no to this uh, invitation because really, if anybody is to support our own sisters, I think um, we owe it to ourselves. So charity begins at home. That's why I'm here with you today. Um, my name, like you indicated, is George Bass, and I am originally from the Gambia. Been in the United States for quite a long time now, but uh, um, by way of origin, I'm from the uh, in the village, little village called Sposinia. Um, But I have resided across the United States, and uh, for some odd reason, I ended up settling in, the, in Minnesota, uh, of all places, obviously, considering the cold uh, <laughs> weather here. So one would think maybe I would find a much warmer climate. Uh, but I think I have acclimated myself with uh, the, minute, the cold weather in Minnesota now. Um, you know, professionally, um, I went to Senegal since high school. Um, well, after graduation, I worked for l 4 Gambia Limited uh, back in the days, um, and then left, the, left for the United States uh, back in 98. Um, I've been in the U.S. since. Um, arriving in the U.S., I have since uh, went on to pursue a bachelor's degree, uh, first in uh, finance, and then ended up doing my MBA in finance and economics. Um, and I uh, currently work for the state of Minnesota as a director of business services uh, with the Minnesota State System of Higher Education. Uh, the system consists of about 37 colleges and universities in one single system. So uh, that wow. in a nutshell description. That's a rich background that you have right there. I am definitely impressed. Um, let's go back to Gambia. What are some of the childhood memories or fun memories that you can remember during your school days or growing up um, in, in, in Fonyi? Well, um, um, you know, we back in the day, I think um, it's only by a miracle because frankly, um, where I used to live, or my parents used to live, is um, a remote village that is way off the main highway, the Trans-Gambian Highway. Mm -hmm. um, we trekked about uh, uh, five kilometers to go to school one way. Um, somehow we managed to complete our primary education at Ndemban Primary. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, some of the interesting uh, memories were the fact that um, there were some subjects that I didn't like, some of which included uh, things like RE, if you will, religious education. Um, mm -hmm. So um, growing up, I think I was, uh, many would say, a, a stubborn child. Uh, but I, I, I never viewed myself as such. Uh, to me, I was very opinionated. Um, I found myself really making friends with people that are equals of my dad. And uh, this actually was situations that worried my mom to some degree. I'm uh, often wondering why I can't um, strike a much deeper friendship with people of my age. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, reflecting back, I think that only demonstrated that uh, even at a young age, I was um, really uh, someone with great wisdom. Um, and so obviously listening and learning from elders, uh, if, I, if you will, really broadened my perspective about life. Uh, and that is something that continued to propel me uh, both in my private life and in my professional career as well. Um, I, I thrive in every uh, given environment. And so, you know, I remember 
Uh, today, I, I am very much into politics um, here in the United States. But I think looking back at my uh, academic career in the Gambia, um, mm -hmm. even at an earlier age, um, I ran for things like, you know, the school head boy. Uh, often my closest friends, in fact, uh, were doubtful. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I proved them wrong um, in every incident or, or position that I, I went for. Um, at St. Augustine's, I remember I was uh, school, uh, prefect at St. Augustine's High School as well. And so I viewed those because my attitude, obviously, is simple. And that is, uh, if you really want to change um, uh, or effect change in, humans, in any human society, uh, you have to claim a seat at the table. Um, sure. Often, policies are created and implemented from within. Um, and obviously, anybody within the peripherals really can only... Uh, complain about policies being unfavorable, but really to effect change, one has to claim a seat at the table. And that is something that continued to really, um, if you will, very informed um, my professional life and my private life as well. Wow, that's that's great. Um, going back, I mean, it looks like you migrated from the Gambia to the United States. Um, what what year was that, and what motivated your move from to migrate from the Gambia to the U.S.? So, um, you know, I came to the U.S. in 1998. Um, mm -hmm. You know, actually, you know, I after securing a visa for the U.S., I was very doubtful because at the time. Um, I had a very recent job, um, and so uh, abandoning my job for something that is, if you will, the, the big unknown, um, mm -hmm. was something that I hesitated to do. And so I, I secured a visa and stayed in the Gambia for about a year, really uh, contemplating whether or not this was a good move. And so in the end, I was able to connect with a few friends in the U.S., um, you know, with, with some coaxing, if you will, um, to some degree I decided you know, I was going to adventure and see what the future holds for me. And then I left the U.S. for the U.S. in 98, um, landed in New York and took a taxi to LaGuardia and uh, made my way to Atlanta, Georgia, where I started my U.S. Um, uh, residency. So um, in Atlanta for a, a number of years there, then I left um, for some reason, ended up in Madison, Wisconsin. But obviously, um, that's because I had a very good um, friend of mine, uh, whom actually I call a brother from Brikama. And so, you know, once we connected, uh, I made the move from Atlanta to uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I, you know, ironically, I spent a very limited time in Madison because after arriving there, um, I decided um, I was going to go to school. And so um, I contacted a university in Georgia, Fort Valley State University. And so I got acceptance. Again, I packed up my stuff and went to Georgia. Um, you know, the university didn't have any finance program, and I was I started with um, business administration. I so then decided uh, I wanted to switch. And I, by luck, I ran into a professor at the university that I was, who is a Nigerian, uh, who mm -hmm. came from St. Cloud State University in Minnesota here. Um, he mentioned the university has a finance program, and that's actually what brought me to Minnesota. Um, so I, in Minnesota, I think I've spent a little over 20 years here, um, and I think I've uh, moved around the state uh, quite a lot. Uh, I just recently, about four years ago, came from northwest Minnesota um, mm -hmm. to the southeastern part of the state, so from one extreme to the other, if you will. Um, so I, you know, I think um, this has been a great move for me. Um, I think I learned a lot. Um, I think what I would tell anybody out there is that uh, never settle for that which is comfortable. Um, you know, if you're going to follow your comfort, uh, that's where you must remain. Uh, mm -hmm. It is important to explore and face challenges. And I think for me, uh, what excites me in life is the challenges that I face and the ability really uh, to be able to overcome them. Uh, and that is what drives me every day. Wow, wow, what would you say would you are say, some uh, of the challenges that you were facing at the time, at the time as a new as person a migrating, migrating from Africa to the States? Well, obviously, um, as you or you may know, I think when you first land in, the, in a foreign land uh, or the U.S., if we'll be, if we'll be specific here, uh, I think how you settle, uh, an mm -hmm. ability really to be able to have 
um, you know, an opportunity to secure a job, to be able to at least have a sustainable living in this country is challenging. Mm -hmm. But having to do that, in addition to um, really try to secure an education, um, and as at the time, really without any um, uh, financial support, uh, the challenges were, were, were daunting. Um, and so I had to work night shifts and go to school during the day. Um, but uh, tough situations, but I was able to prevail. Uh, it goes to tell you that with determination and commitment, um, there is nothing that we cannot overcome. And so uh, those were some of the, the most difficult challenges. My school days really and balancing, balancing that and juggling that with uh, with, with having to uh, go to school and support family at home, as you all know. Um, I, and more so, when I first got here, during those days, my dad fell sick. And so really providing uh, for the family was a primary responsibility, uh, which I never mm -hmm. sighed away from. Uh, but I think uh, with, with God's blessing, uh, most of those we are able to um, run smoothly um, in parallel. Would you say your expectation matches the reality on the ground here? Because when we are back home, we always hear about Babylon or want to go to Europe or America. So would you say your expectations uh, matches the reality? Well, I, you know, I have to tell you, um, you know, and, and I say this to young, young people when I am in the Gambia these days. Mm -hmm. I think when, when you don't know or you hear about a place, mm -hmm. Um, your expectations, particularly in the developing world, mm -hmm. uh, the belief is that once you find yourself in the West, um, you know, life is glorious. Um, you know, it's, it's not the case. This, this, is, this is, if you must survive in this country, I think the mm -hmm. amount of work we put in, um, if one would do the same in our home country, I think you will be able to have a very sustainable living within your home country. Uh, if you reflect back as Gambians, I think there are a lot of things that we see some people come from, even in the sub-Saharan Africa, uh, who are doing a lot of things that really um, enable them to be very successful right in front of us. But as Gambians, we really feel too proud, I think, in, in some de to some degree, um, mm -hmm. to, be en to engage ourselves in some of those um, uh, career, if you will not, if you wouldn't call it career, but some type form of business. Mm -hmm. right to be able to um you know earn a living a sustainable living um, i think what people in our back home and the youngsters particularly what we wouldn't know or believe is that once you are lucky enough actually to get out of the gambia you would realize and nobody would tell you this that you have to buckle up and go to work right. if you must add an education it's going to require a commitment and an uphill battle to get there if you must secure a job and just work, mm -hmm. you must really buckle up and work hard uh, to be able to sustain yourself and be able to do something meaningful for your family or friends back home. So hard work really is what defines life, irrespective of where you are. And I think um, there is a need for all of us, myself included, uh, that we really look at some of the facts on the ground and mm -hmm. try to come up, even if it is going to be by way of policy, for instance, if you're looking at it from a government uh, point of view, mm -hmm. by way of policy, I think we as a people uh, should be able to instill some processes and policies and procedures on the ground that would enable people or provide the platform uh, for the younger generation to thrive without really needing to look abroad to for greener pastures. I think the greener pastures are, can be found right on the ground uh, if, in fact, um, we, that, those that are in the leadership are willing to provide that platform upon which people can actually um, use their ingenuity uh, to be able to spur up some productivity right within our home country. And mm -hmm. providing these avenues, in my view, additionally would create if you will, employment uh, for the youth, which we all know is a major problem in the country. So, you know, the expectations really um, only goes as far as you are still outside the Western world. But once you find yourself in the Western world, irrespective of where it may be, in the United States or across the pond, 
I think we realize the reality really comes to bear that you must work hard if you must succeed. And those things are very critical. You must work you hard must in work order hard. to succeed. It looks like, I mean, you currently work for the um, community college in Minnesota, if I'm correct. Can you tell correct. us a bit about that? So my current, uh, you know, um, you know, duties, uh, if you will, um, as a director of business services, um, I supervise our business offices, all the staff in the business office. So I have about 17 people that work directly under me. Now, I see we have three different campuses. Now, in F on every campus, I have uh, staff uh, both in all three locations, if you will. Um, in addition to the business offices, I'm also responsible for our auxiliary services. Um, if you will, the auxiliary enterprises would be the bookstores, for instance. And we have bookstores in all locations as well. So really, it is, it is a big, if you will, a huge responsibility. Um, dealing with personnel alone is, is very challenging. Uh, but I think one thing that I found that's very useful to me uh, is the understanding that if you treat your people right, they will give you their very best. Uh, and that is, I think, is um, an experience um, uh, or a principle that I think uh, it's really needed everywhere, not just in the United States. And so my commitment is to my people. It's my duty. And often I tell them uh, my relationship with my staff is an inverse one. In other words, I work for them and not the other way around. And here's why I say that. Um, I, exp I have some expectations of every single staff that I have, but the fact remains for them to be successful, I must provide the tools necessary. The tools in this case could be training, the necessary training uh, for my staff to be successful, right? Providing a work environment uh, that is conducive to my staff, uh, making sure that I provide or uh, instill in them um, a positive work environment. These things are very critical. In addition, you must also insist on having a civil workplace, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. everybody has to respect. We, we all operate in different forms or ways, if you will. And, and to be fair, I think um, if you look at supervision, you have to know your staff because they all come with different strengths and weaknesses. I think really knowing your staff would mean, in my case, really having to understand every individual's strengths and utilize those strengths, tap into their abilities uh, to be able to increase productivity. Um, I think these are some of the things that uh, I continue to do on a daily basis here. Um, in addition, uh, the other thing that I, because I found myself in an educational setting, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that is critical and have been very, very important to me, I think it's a learned experience in the sense that, you know, I went through school here and so I know some of the challenges that I faced when I was going through education, higher ed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so something that I do uh, on a daily basis uh, from an administrative point of view is to ensure that we empower the underprivileged kids so that they are able to be successful when they are academic work. Uh, how do you do that? Just like I said initially, you cannot effect change. And if you want to do it effectively, you have to demand a seat at the table to make sure that the policies that come out benefit everybody and not just a select few. And so, for instance, some of the things that I did is allow every student that is going through our institution, irrespective of financial aid, uh, to be able to charge up to $800, uh, if you will, in the bookstores, securing their instructional materials on day one, thereby empowering them to be successful in their academic work, right? And so if you look at it, um, those of us that went through education here, higher ed, would understand the challenges that underprivileged children or, or students face. Mm -hmm. Inability really without financial aid, obviously if you're an American citizen, you have funding and you are able to secure some of the resources you need to be able to be successful. But if you have, let's say, for instance, an international student or mm -hmm. minority kids, for instance, right, they may not necessarily have, if you're an international student, you may not necessarily have funding. 
And so you have to pay your way through the through education. And so you may not have resources, in fact, to be able to purchase books, which sometimes may cost you up to five, six, seven, eight hundred, depending on what program you are in. Right. And so giving them the ability to secure those resources on day one, irrespective of what their financial status is, I think is very critical in ensuring that those students go on to be successful in the academic work. And I think if you look at it, it, you know, it also benefits the institution in being able to retain those students and being able to provide a positive experience, as well as really, um, you know, a recruitment is a major thing in higher ed today. So retention is very, very critical. When students are satisfied, when they feel there is, um, you know, a future for them within, within the institution, I think the tendency for them to stay until they graduate is much higher. How did you become the honorary um, council member of the city of Austin? Well, um, well, I, I alluded to the fact that uh, politics is one of my passion. And mm -hmm. uh, my passion for politics is not to say, or it is not propelled by a personal interest of my own. But rather, I have an interest in making sure I shape policy, public policy, in a manner that benefits the communities, if you will, that I find myself. And so in 2016, uh, I was the Democratic Party candidate, nominated an endorsed candidate uh, for Minnesota State Legislature. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was the year of Donald Trump, as you may know. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us Democratic candidates, we are not very successful. However, even though that was my first run, and I ran in a district that is 99.99% white, so in a rural district, and you can imagine um, how much an uphill battle that would be um, for a minority candidate, number one, but more importantly, a candidate that speaks with an accent, you are an immigrant, and so really, right there, you have your work cut out for you. But interestingly, though, um, some of the candidates that actually, uh, some of the constituents that rejected me at the beginning of the, my campaign mm -hmm. um, got, to, got to know me as things went on, to the point where a lot of them were actually inviting me to their homes uh, for supper, just wanting to actually listen to some of my views, my visions, and my policies. And so when the election came by, even though I lost, I lost by about, I gained about 48% of the vote. And I thought that was very, very uh, successful for a first run. But mm -hmm. soon after that, I move, I pick up a job here and I move to the southeastern part of the state where I currently reside. So when I got here, uh, I found the city is a very progressive one because we have a major company in town um, that really is into uh, every uh, community-based programs uh, to help minority communities particularly within the district, within the city. <laughs> and so I found myself um, really representing, if you will, the college, the institution where I work um, in some of the, what we call um, community engagement. <laughs> and so I was invited to a lot of events within the city. Uh, in one of those events, I found myself on the opposite ends with the mayor of the city, discussing some of the critical issues that we think, or he, we think at the time, uh, would be of value to the city of Austin. And so following that conversation and some of the exchange and some of the ideas that I put forth, um, he, may, he came up to me and asked who I was and where I work and how long I have been in the this, in this city. So I gave him my profile and I left. And so a few days later, he called, actually called my office line and said, hey, this is Mayor Tom Steam and I would like to really have lunch with him. So, we made an appointment, went out to lunch, um, and after that, the next thing I got was an, an, they requested that I run for um, you know, city council. And I said, no, I have no interest right now. I just came from a one, one office run. Um, at the moment, I'm focus, I have some areas of focus for me, and that is one, my career, number one. But number two, um, I was really interested um, in taking part in shaping policies both within my work environment as well as the communities and representing if you will uh, the minority community in 
the city of Austin. And the reason I'm talking about it, I, that was important, is because we have, we have a lot of uh, Southeast Asians, who are plenty of them, that are in the city. In addition, we have so many African immigrants in the city also, who work in, some, in this major uh, plant, if you will, that's a food processing plant. And so some of the challenges that I think that these communities are facing is that a lot of their kids that are going through the school district, <laughs> kids in K through 12, really need some mentorship, if you will, uh, to be able to shape their future. What we, what we found happening, what I found happening, is that a lot of the kids will finish high school. Instead of thinking college, they will also pick up jobs where their mom and dad is working at the plants, food processing plants. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you look at that, and if you really want to have an immigrant community, a vibrant immigrant community, it is critical, therefore, to ensure uh, that the younger generation are focused in attaining some level of education uh, to be able to be competitive and uh, as such become valuable members of the, the city that they find themselves. And so to do that, I began to ask questions and engage the city leadership as well as the school district leadership uh, as to how we can create a mentorship program, particularly for minority, minority kids, where they will be able to, if you will, um, at least get some help with their homeworks. Often what is happening is these kids are leaving school and the parents are at work. Whether they did their homework or not, the parents don't know. Um, a majority of the parents also are illiterate. They are not, they did not receive any formal education. And so homework is a thing that is strange to them. Whether this is something they have to do. If, you, if you're thinking the Southeast Asians, for instance, you know, <laughs> the kids are graduating and they're all going to work at the plant where they, their parents work. So we need to change that trajectory because if you think about it, um, they have to be thinking long term. And long term really is to educate the younger generation because they are the future leadership. They should be our hope for tomorrow. And so that was a course that I took up. And so as a result, after I rejected running for city council, then the city council came together and voted unanimously um, uh, and uh, allowed me to, uh, selected me, if you will, uh, to run, uh, to, be, to represent the city as an honorary city council member. And so when I got on that committee, that, um, you know, council, um, what I did, again, like I often say, you can always shape policy from within. I said to the mayor and the city leadership, I can only serve for a number of time, but one thing that is important, we have a lot of immigrants that are in the city. We need to reach out to them and see if in fact this can become, um, if you will, a tradition where you tap some of the minorities in this community all right and bring them on board so that they understand the inner workings of the city uh, this will in turn inform if you will the parents and also expose the children uh, to begin to think about positions of leadership in the future uh, and that is something that um, i was glad that the rest of the council actually voted in support of and today we have that recycling if you will of city council uh, appointed city council members who come to the to the council and with next meetings participate uh, representing if you will the Karani community which is southeastern asians and some african immigrants that are in the city as well so my passion for politics never ends and so because of this i also find myself on myself on uh, some board uh, board of directors within the city for several companies um, in addition to taking up some um, if you will, service organizations like uh, the Rotary Club of Austin, Minnesota, uh, where I, I currently serve. So, um, you know, my life, I think, uh, what gives me the greatest pleasure is an ability really to impact the people and shape policy in such a way uh, that people would be better off as a result. And that's my commitment. That's where I found my life's worth. Wow. wow. Are you looking forward, you looking to, forward contesting to contesting for city, city council, council again, again in, the in the near future? Actually, that is not um, in my in the works for me. Um, <laughs> um, you know, in 2018, um, mm -hmm. you know, I I uh, put my name forward. Uh, I was ready to run for because the I don't know if you are following Minnesota, but our current governor. Um, who is Tim Walls, a, a Democrat, uh, was in the U.S. Congress for so many years. 
And so he retired from that and ran for the state governor. And so when he won, obviously his seat became open. And so I put my name in the hat uh, to become the Democratic Party nominee uh, for a seat, uh, for a US Congress seat. But um, that year, the primaries, I lost. So the candidate that won the primaries on the Democratic side uh, went on to lose the elections uh, as well. And so he is running for the second term. So I'm hoping that he wins, but in the event he doesn't, uh, we may have to revisit that primary contest again uh, to see where that may lead. So I, I just continue to uh, look ahead and see uh, what potentials lie that I, sh I believe I should be able to reach. What does Mr. Bass do on his spare time? Well, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, my, <laughs> spare time, my spare time is very boring. Um, I'll tell you that right now. And, and for obvious reasons. Um, I think I indicated some of the responsibilities I have professionally. And I think what that has done for me, um, I spend most of my time really making sure that I'm addressing questions, um, you know, making sure that I provide the support that my staff need uh, to be able to be successful on a daily basis. So what that does in turn though, is that it, is, it puts off some of my other responsibilities, my daily responsibilities. So often my spare time, I spend that actually making sure I provide or meet some of those expectations that I have to do behind the scenes that my, it, because I spend most of my time supporting my staff. One good example of that is um, I do all the financial statements for our foundation. So I do that on a monthly basis for them because we have a very weird, co weird combination or relationship, if you will. And so uh, what that has done at the beginning of this semester, though, um, I lost my veteran bookstore manager and so because uh, due to retirement. So now I have new staff in the bookstore. I have to make sure that I am hands on. Now the foundation is hounding me to say, saying, hey, we need our financial statements. When are you going to get those ready? And I said, well, give me some time. And, you know, so I'm working to see how best I can meet those expectations. So as a result, sometimes I spend my time actually working on weekends, um, you know, to be able to meet some of those obligations. So my spare times are pretty boring. I was expecting you would say, oh, I go to the beach or just sit around, enjoy the sunshine. But I guess you have a busy life, which is understandable. <laughs> Coming back to politics, because I know you're deep into politics. You love politics. Do you have any political ambitions as relate to the Gambia? Well, um, you know, yes, I do. Um, uh, but, you know, there are some obstacles, obviously. Uh, but quite frankly, yes, I do have an ambition for the Gambia. Um, and not, again, it's not an egocentric one. In other words, I, I believe I have an ability to bring people together. Um, I can collaborate with anyone. I can work with any one person. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I think I do the best is that um, I welcome uh, dissenting opinions. In other words, if you want to be successful in leadership, understand people are going to disagree with you. And if, in fact, um, you know, you know anything, a thing or two about leadership too, you must understand that those that dissent uh, often are the people that actually anchor you uh, to be able to actually produce something that is meaningful and representative of everybody across the board. I am not a big fan of people that come in and support your viewpoints every time. Mm -hmm. The same goes in my professional life. Often when I meet with my staff on a weekly basis, uh, the person that really doesn't say anything is the person I'm interested to hear from. And so often they, my staff all know this about me. I don't like people to come and agree with everything that I'm saying. I like you to challenge my opinions. Because when we come and agree, it doesn't take long before we begin to group think. If you look at the political trajectory in the Gambia, for instance, or Africa for that matter, Hardly do you find people in government really disagreeing with the leader. And this is not something that um, we should be dismissing easily. And I say that because, you know, our cultural, the, the nature of our culture, the norms, 
really put in place or allow for some of these behaviors we see in the leadership roles today. Those norms suggest or dictate somebody in the leadership is one that you don't question. Mm -hmm. So when they say you do, that's wrong. Somebody that is an elder, when they speak, therefore you must do as they tell you. That is wrong. But these are some of the things really that are setting us back. Because we have one thing, if it, I have to be honest, one thing that really comforts me is that I am very proud of every son and daughter of the Gambia. For if you look at the per capita of our country, we have so many educated Gambians out there who can change that country without question. Right. Why do you think they are not participating? But often, even when we find somebody that we are hopeful will bring about change, their efforts are usually stifled by the fact that the norms on the ground does not provide a vehicle for them to actually be productive. These things are affecting our countries. These things are affecting the way we deliver the interests of our citizenry. And so my hope is that um, I think we can come together. I don't value our tribal differences, which is another, another big cancer in the country. If you look at it, let's bring it back for a second. <laughs> One thing that you and I know for sure on a daily basis mm -hmm. is that we continue and we have found this fight in the United States, the fight against racial equality. This is something that if there is any stain on the moral values of this country, that is one major one of it. Equally, we, if you look at it, we also come here and in fact we get acc acclimated to a point where we demand to be treated equally. Mm -hmm. Why then we Gambians, must we find ourselves in our home only to allow ourselves to be divided either by our background where you come from or a language that you speak? I think it's very myopic. But sadly though, to change some of these norms in the country, it's gonna require a leadership that understands and transcend some of these, if you will, major blockades that continue to really set us back year after year, decade after decade. If you look at since we got independence, nothing has been done for the Gambia. Mm -hmm. But we continue, nothing is done because we continue to accept. We continue to accept this underperformance by our leadership. But if anybody must demand a change, if Gambia must change, if Gambia must develop, I, I assure you, it's not gonna take any miracle. It's gonna require us Gambians coming together to make it happen. And so this is, these are some of the things that are lacking in the country. The one thing that I think is a major setback too, is the way we develop, and it's, I wouldn't say maybe not we, but really the leadership put together, let's say for instance, the constitution of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you shape that document in a manner that really limits certain sons and daughters of the country uh, to be able, the ability to actually perform or deliver or partake in our national development, then really, are you doing yourself a service or a disservice as a nation? But the reason these things are happening, the reason why we are saying, if you have dual citizenship, or if maybe, for instance, you haven't lived in the Gambia for more than four, three or four or five years, therefore you cannot participate in a national leadership, uh, in a national leadership role. I'll tell you what I think of that. Mm -hmm. I think what is, what is really happening is that those that are in power figured this is a way to minimize or eradicate any meaningful challenge to their authority. It's a way to secure themselves and continue to under deliver for our people, yet nothing can be done about it. I think it is self-serving rather than serving the interests of the country. But these conversations, in my view, are national conversations that we all must demand of our leadership. <laughs> but if they continue, however, I think there are so many 
I'm not the only one. There are so many potential Gambians out there who I trust have what it takes, who I believe can deliver and rescue the country. But they can't because they are limited by a constitution that does not represent the interests of the country, but rather serving, self-serving to those that are in the position of authority at the current day. And that is a problem. So my hope for the Gambia is to bring about um, a system that really ensures some accountability, some transparency, and really one that demand, demands national service, a unity of the country, all of us coming together uh, to be able to actually quarrel irrespective of our differences in the interests of the country. Because if you think about it, irrespective of where I come from, we are all Gambians first. That should be the greatest definition of who we are than anything else, than what tribal language you speak. I am a Gambian. I speak about four different languages from the Gambia. And I have to thank God thank because God. if I speak either, you will think I was, that's my tribe. You would not easily know which tribe I actually come from if I speak Mandinka to you. Or maybe if I speak Jola, or maybe if I speak Wolof, right? So, so these are things that I think they are minor, if you will, uh, in terms of our national development. Yes, we must preserve our culture. We must preserve our languages. But I think we have to recognize each other in ourselves. And until we do, we, we really will continue to see the same um, setback in the underperformance the lack of economic development, inability to really shape a future or provide a vision that the country or the younger generation can look up to and be hopeful for their future and their livelihood. You have raised very important points right there. And um, that makes me to question or ask, how would you rate the current political situation in the Gambia in your own view? Well, the current political situation, one thing that I will tell you is that I am highly encouraged by um, the number of parties that are emerging in the Gambia today. I'll tell you why, because I know many will disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I have spoken to some friends that say, hey, why are we having all these political parties in the Gambia? It's just too much. But I'll tell you why I'm encouraged by it. Mm -hmm. The reason why I like the fact that we are seeing so many uh, Gambians really stepping up and saying, hey, we are forming a political party. The reason I like, is, like this so much no, is not to suggest that any of these parties would be successful. Equally, not to suggest these parties are not going to be successful. But I like it in the sense that if you have more political parties in the country, it will engage the leadership, mm -hmm. force them to engage in a national conversation about our current state of affairs as well as the future of the country, right? But if you limit it to a, a single party, for instance, really, it's you, you will continue to get the same narrative. And so you will really never really be able to explore the potential of ideas that exist within the country uh, that could benefit who we are as a people. And I think if we engage in such a national conversation at such a broad level, I think what it does, it's informed the electorate, a lot of whom today are not, if you will, illiterates per se. One good thing about the Gambia is the fact that today we have a university there. Call it what you may, I think it is brightening and broadening the minds of our younger generation. And I think it's also creating, um, you know, the leadership that we need for tomorrow. And so, it, you know, the more political parties we have, is really, if you will, um, you know, probing the minds of these young people in a manner that they would begin to listen to people that actually have the platform to speak about what vision they have for the country. Mm -hmm. And I think if we continue these conversations, uh, what it will do is really uh, force anyone that is in leadership to begin to think differently because it will create an understanding that what we have been used to from the Jawara regime or to the Jame regime or the current regime, for instance, it's not something that is here to stay. The people are going to demand change. And that's why I am highly encouraged by the emergence of some of these political parties we see in the Gambia. Although I must state 
And this is just a word of caution, caution to my fellow Gambians out there who are thinking or who currently own a political party. You must have a purpose. You must have a purpose. And your purpose should be the interest of the people, service to the people before self. But I think what we have is service to self before people. And that's why we can never, never see anything meaningful or valuable. And that's going to bring about a national economic development that is going to positively impact the lives of our younger generation or the Gambia as a nation. With your rich resume and background and experience in life, and of course, outside the Gambia, should the Gambians expect you to go back someday to serve your country with all the knowledge and experiences that you have so we can move the country forward? Is that something you look forward to in the future? Well, let me just say this. I think, I think a great question, but I'll tell you that um, this is not just me. I think certainly, to answer your question, certainly I'm always willing and open to share an idea or two about how I feel the country should be thinking about reshaping and developing a vision that's going to ensure um, mm -hmm. you know, the country moves forward from its current state. But that's not just me. There are so many other Gambians who will do the same for the country. Mm -hmm. The problem is we've seen some that actually went home only to find themselves rather hopeless because they are frustrated by the nepotism, if you will, mm -hmm. the corruption in the country, and as a result, some of them are sitting, if I may, if you would allow me, I just want to cite one individual. And I know this is going to probably create um, a controversy, but I'm fine with it. But I'll tell you guys this. You know, if you think about it, uh, recently, a few years back, there was one Gambian who I don't know, to be honest with you, and if you talk to this gentleman, he's going to tell you, I don't know who this guy is. But you must be familiar with a guy called Manjang who find himself as the head of uh, social security and housing a few years back. Yeah. Now, I will tell you something. The guy, in my view, is not a saint. He doesn't have the silver bullet. But the vision that he had for that department in the country was one that really, if you are in leadership, you ought to allow him to implement his vision for that, for that department. Mm -hmm. But rather, what did they do? Frustrate his efforts. What happened there is that I, in my view, personal opinion here, it's a matter of personal opinion, so please do not crucify me because I'm entitled to it. Right. But I'll tell you this. I think each time you try to implement change, people will push back. And there are so many studies that have demonstrated why people push back. It's because when you find yourself in a comfort zone, and really operating under certain sets of values or norms and somebody comes and want to eclipse those with something totally new that you are not familiar with well people push back why are we changing and i have to admit you know it is said that if it is not broke why change it mm -hmm. but the reason is if it is not broke why why we must change it even if it is not broke it's because there are so many great potentials that lie on the other side unless you think about changing you will never realize those potentials sure. and so it may not broke this is why and people must realize this is why we have what we call continuous improvement now continuous improvement may not make sense if you're talking government but i'll tell you that if you find yourself in manufacturing continuous improvement is a critical piece because it's a cost saver if you can do something that you are able to be productive, if you can do it more efficiently, you save more resources as a result. Mm -hmm. Equally, I think people have to begin to think along those lines. You may have policies that you put in place. They may be working, but they understand that there are better ways to shape those policies in a manner that it will deliver success for the greater good. The greater good is the interest of the country and not an individual. The greater good is the interest of the country and not the presidency. The greater good is the interest of the country and not the executive branch. The greater good is the interest of the country and not the legislature. So these are some of the things that we have to begin to think about. 
Uh, we have to begin to accept some of these values as Gambians if we must do something productive for the younger generation. Obviously, um, what are we going to, often people will say, what will you tell your grandchildren? What did you do? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why I'm always open to providing or sharing my opinions where they matter. But that remains to be seen. We will see what the future holds for all of us. But yes, I do have uh, those ambitions and I think, and I believe strongly that I have what it takes to bring people together in the interest of the country. That I can promise. What will Mr. What Bass will Mr. like Bass to be remembered, to be remembered for? for? Well, um, if anything, I would love to be remembered for a guy who really will do anything to serve others before he thinks about his own personal self. Uh, that is something that has defined my professional and private life. And that's something that I'll continue to do um, wherever I see fit. Uh, and that is something that I value greatly as well. Since we're coming to the end of this interview, what would you say to that young person watching you right now and got inspired by your story or your life journey and experiences? What, would, what advice would you offer to that person out there? Well, the, my advice that I would provide to the young people out there, Gambians particularly, um, you know, continue to dream. And uh, don't let anybody tell you that you cannot do it. You have it in you to actually be successful. You have it in you to change the status quo. You have it in you to bring people together. Now, change doesn't come easy, but understand that change may potentially begin with you, a single individual. Um, all it takes is for you not to be silent, speak up. But if you must do it, do it in a genuine manner. Represent the interests of the country. Never do anything because you think it would benefit you as an individual. For that, will never move us forward as a nation. I like that. Any final words? Well, final words, really, if any, I would just say, I am proud to see one of my own Gambian sister out there um, really uh, engaging the rest of the country um, in a conversation that I think, uh, if done well, if done genuinely, it will spur up, if you will, a, com a national conversation to bring about meaningful change that will benefit us as a nation. And I think we must, as Gambians, uh, transcend our pettiness that really we see division where there are none, mm -hmm. right? We see walls where there are none, really. And so this mirage that we continue to use uh, to divide us, I think it is time we Gambians really come together and reject every single one of them. And I think this is critical. And I, I am really uh, proud of the fact that uh, you are taking that initiative uh, to be part of that, com that, that greater conversation that I think would potentially bring about the greater good for the country. So I commend you on your efforts and I thank for your time as well. I definitely thank you for joining us today on LSTV1. It's a great honor to have someone like you with your experience and journey in life to come over here and then take time out of your busy schedule to give us this interview. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. The pleasure is all mine. You have a wonderful evening. You too. Take care and bye for now. Bye now. Well, darling viewers, thank you very much for joining us on this interview with um, George Bass, of course, as you heard from him. George is resided in uh, Minnesota here in America and has been here for a very long time, since 1998. And he has a lot of experience as far as international um, um situations or political issues are concerned so as you heard from him that's mr bass for you but then we appreciate the comments the likes the questions and everything that you guys put out there we see it we love it we appreciate it keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel lstv1 on youtube follow us on instagram like our page that way you will not miss anything that we post online until i come your way again it's your call Lady Bar, and this is your Talk to Lady show. Take care and be safe out there. Till next time. Bye for now. We often admire people's successes, but never take the time to explore their challenges. Talk to Lady brings out the inside stories of the peaks and valleys of our daily struggles. A weekly show that features people and stories from all walks of life. 
I probably don't look like I chopped cotton or picked cotton, but I did. And now, in a, in a, what, this is a half a million dollar property home, up to half a million dollar home. You'll hear success stories from rags to riches that will inspire you to aspire to be great. Be the first to know only on LSTV One.